Excellent. Cool. My name's Diogo. Um, as some background, I've won a series of international and machine learning competitions. Um, and I work in Analytic, where we've been using deep learning for medicine, focusing on medical image analysis. According to some sources, we are a pretty smart company. And we've done a lot of cool stuff. But this presentation is not about the stuff that we've done that was really smart, but it's about the not-so-smart stuff that we've done and lessons we've learned from that. So that's why it's called Medical Deep Learning Lessons Learned. As some disclaimers, um, I'm assuming a background in deep learning, but feel free to ask questions at any time. Um, I, I really like when questions are answered, uh, qu asked mis midway through. Some of these lessons will apply to more than medicine, and some of them will apply to more than deep learning. They might sound like general machine learning lessons that seem obvious, and if they're obvious to you, that's great. They were not obvious to us. And these are like especially applicable to medical deep learning because there are some problems here that you might not even think about when you're, if you come from like a machine learning background. So let's get started with the 10 lessons. Lesson one, thou shalt not ask why thy model works. This is a pretty common thing for all of deep learning. Um, unfortunately, we wish our, we could ask this, but we can't. And my favorite deep learning joke is, why did the neural network cross the road? The answer is we don't know, but it did it really well. Um, and this, this is reflected in this like, comprehensive list of practical useful deep learning theory. And it's really unfortunate that there's actually no useful deep learning theory. All of the theory on deep learning is actually completely not applicable to anything that happens in practice. I hope that this changes. I'm kind of not optimistic about that. But um, there's a lot of smart people working on it nowadays. And this basically means that we don't really have any theory to help us answer really hard questions. So everything is guided by experiments and guesswork. And the thing with experiments is that you don't know if that's going to generalize at all, right? So it's a pretty common problem that we just never know when for sure uh, deep learning will work on a problem. And we don't know that ahead of time. So we actually have to do a lot of work if something doesn't uh, to make something work. And if it doesn't work, we don't know whose fault it is. Is it our fault for not trying hard enough? Or is it deep learning, like it's not a good problem for deep learning, right? And we can't answer a lot of the big questions that are like very important from a business perspective in order to like get something running. Like which problems are solvable? How much data is needed? Like every partner we have asks us like, this sounds really cool, how much data do you need? And we like shrug our shoulders and like, give some random number, you know, like 50,000 or something like that. The amount of times, like, business people have asked me, like, just give a number, any number. Like, it's all the numbers are equally wrong, so just say something. It happens so much. Um, how, how to construct architectures and hy set hyperparameters. There's, like, no theory behind this. It's really, like, just copy what other people have done. And even just understanding the smallest changes to neural networks, it's something we just don't know how to do. So lesson two. In contrast to the other one, thou shalt ask how thy model works. A very popular myth is that neural networks are not interpretable, and I feel like that couldn't be further from the truth. I've never had like, a machine learning model that I felt was as interpretable as a deep network is. Um, there's a lot of really awesome techniques for this. Um, there are black box techniques, so this is, has nothing to do with neural networks. Any kind of good enough classifier you can make into a pretty good visualization into how it works. Um, so this one is an extremely simple one where you simply take your image, you block out part of your image, you run it through the model, and you do this repeated times using blocking out different parts of your input image and see how it changes. So if something is useless to your classification, then you'd expect your probability to not change a lot. If it changes a lot, then it's probably useful. And the beauty of this is this can be applied to all sorts of domains. I've done it on images a lot, I've done it on text, I've done it on genomics. It works equally well in all of them. It actually works embarrassingly well, such that maybe the more complicated stuff is not even necessary. Highly recommend trying it. Um, there are other techniques that involve, um, they're like more neural network based, that involve interpreting an already trained model and um, basically doing another pass through the network in order to try to understand that more. Uh, this technique is called guided backpropagation, and it involves fiddling with a backwards pass, such that you have uh, your image. You pass the image through the neural network. It has some intermediates that's created. You have your final result, and you say, like, this is an interesting final result. Recreate the image given this final result. Um, and naturally, as your neural network gets, passes through, uh, as, as the image passes through the neural network, more and more information is lost that's not useful to, to classification. And as you reconstruct that, you get basically the parts that are useful in roughly the magnitude and how useful they are. So this is a really cool trick. It actually can be used in for like production settings. And 
people do love the results of that. Like even doctors who really like precision, they are like consistently impressed by these kinds of things. Um, their tricks involve already trained models and using a full-blown generative model to try to reconstruct what does my network think this thing is. So in this case, you're like given a trained network, you train another network to given the output of a network, predict the input again, and visualize that. And this allows you to get insights into the kind of things your neural network is memorizing. Your ne neural networks are basically memorization machines, and that's kind of problematic because they don't really think. And now, like, using this kind of tricks, you can see the flaws in the network. For example, swimming trunks might not be so accurate in, for this particular model if the swimming trunks are on a shelf, because it looks like it remembers that people are wearing it, and those people are not wearing more clothes. Um, there's other things that you can do that involve actually changing the architecture of your neural network to necessarily tell you which parts are used for the output. These are called attentional models. And when you design these the right way, it basically forces your neural network, in order to get any information from the input, they need to go through this certain component that like, tells you which part it's looking at. And by doing that, you actually get this really, really interpretable thing that's also great for visualization. And uh, you can combine these models together in order to make things that are actually very useful in the context of medical problems. Um, lesson three, honor thy data quality. Uh, one of the first projects we worked on was um, lung nodule classification. And we were training on some human data because it's hard to get ground truth data. So humans like, labeled lung nodules for whether or not they were bad or not. And we trained this like, pretty sweet neural network. It's getting 0.99 AUC. It looks really good. It actually seems a little bit too good. You know, it's actually a hard problem. Um, 0.99 AUC is really high. So we were trying to think, like, this seems off. So we try a random forest on this problem. Random forest and images. That shouldn't work because it's, terrib it's terrible, right, on the raw pixels. It actually gets like a 0.97 AUC. And it turns out what's happening is that the people who provided the labels were doing, just doing a terrible job at it. They were basically making a size classifier. So they kind of thought the bigger the thing is, the more likely it is to be bad. And that's what, what ended up happening. So we trained our model to like, copy them. And it did a great job at copying them, but it was not useful. So we learned very early on that quality often trumps quantity. And bad labels actually give your model the wrong information. In normal deep learning contexts, you sometimes don't worry about that, because if your noise is um, uniform or like, follows certain distributions, then the signal will cancel out. Right? If you could repeatedly sample an image, and your um, noise is not like, um, in any way adversarial, like, on average, you might get the right answer. But that's not the case for medical images, because you might consistently get the wrong answer, which means you might consistently train your models to predict the wrong answer. So it's really, really important to also think about what you're measuring. Because there's a lot, a lot of the times, you might think you know what you're measuring, but you need to be really, really precise with that. Like, for example, you're given an image, you're trying to determine, will there be cancer in five years? And that seems like a very specific thing, but that actually might be a really, that might actually be really bad in terms of data quality. Because what if a person does get cancer in five years, but there's no signs of the cancer five years ago? Now you're training your model to be wrong. And this becomes scary because all, if your data is flawed and all data is flawed, you're basically teaching your model to be wrong sometimes. And really important solutions to this are always to measure the quality of your data. Well, you should always be extremely precise with what you're measuring as well. And it's unfortunately a very manual process in understanding where your labels are lacking and what your noise looks like. And this is something that I don't think that we can get around with as a community, just because um, the kind of things we predict are just unclear sometimes. Uh, lesson four, thou shalt not take the domain in vain. Um, medical data sets can come from a lot of places, but they're rarely from the internet like ImageNet was. And that just means that um, the distribution you have is not e clo anywhere close to uniform um, in terms of the types of images that you'll see in the future. You know, you get them from this one spot, they have diseases in, in a certain distribution, they classify things in a certain distribution, they have certain like population density and all that stuff. And that just means that your, all your data sets will be biased, and your mo thus your models will be biased towards the sources of those distributions. And this becomes a problem for generalization to, let's say you want to, you know, you have like three partners, you've gotten the data, and you say like, okay, I want to make this model run everywhere in the country. That's a little bit scary, because we don't even know what data will look like everywhere in the country, right? Um, 
different places have different definitions of diseases, which was something that was very surprising to me as someone with not a medical background. Um, the definition of disease would be different in Australia as it is in you know, uh, Brazil or something like that. And this makes it even harder for our models because what's the model supposed to do, right? You're giving it the wrong information. Um, and uh, an additional unfortunate thing is that this domain adaptation is a known problem in deep learning, and there are techniques to deal with domain adaptation, and th those techniques are actually really cool. But they all rely on having a sample from your test set, so you kind of need to know what you need to generalize to, and that's the main problem because, because you're lacking that data in the first place, you don't even know what you're going to generalize to. And this has become a problem repeatedly for us when we train a model on CT scans from here, where people are generally on a gown in a CT scan or x-rays where they're, you know, maybe they're not fully clothed. Um, and we look at China where it's often they have buttons and stuff like that, and buttons apparently look a lot like nodules. So this, ki this kind of thing can cause issues. Um, number five, honor thy hardware. Lots of different kinds of problems have different kinds of bottlenecks. So for genomics, you have normally you'd use a recurrent network. You care more about the long-term dependencies. Your matrix multiplies are probably going to be a little bit smaller. So like sequential tasks often sometimes can be done on CPU. On X-rays, you you start to become like imi like ImageNet-like problems, but these are generally much larger. So now you need to care more about RAM, how deep you can make your models. It just changes everything. Or, wh or when you get to CT scans, now you have like a volumetric axis, and all of your downstream activations will have a volumetric axis as well. So this becomes really expensive, and you need to know, like, do you have a 1080? Do you have 4K 80s? Like, and it, this is actually really, really important to know how you design your architecture. And if you try to design your architecture in a very hardware agnostic way, you actually are always going to be leaving performance on the table, because certain hardware does certain things faster, right? If you're using TensorFlow, Perhaps you don't want to use too many element-wise operations because that involves a lot of CUDA kernel calls and TensorFlow doesn't have an optimizer yet. Um, so there's a lot of these little things that are really important to understand when you're designing architectures that you just can't learn from trial and error and you just need to understand how it's going. Um, people should probably honor every part of the stack, but hardware I think is the most often assumed to be abstracted away, especially in medicine where a lot of people who work in medicine think that like, even getting to the deep learning level is like, quite a big step. It's like, whoa, like, we're going all the way into the details here. And it turns out like, there's an entire stack of details more that they need to understand. Um, big one for us as well, number six. Thou shall not assume the latest paper is production ready. I doubt most people assume this. Like, like, most people will not think, like, oh, here's a paper, it's production ready. But if you read something and you see, like, wow, this is super duper cool, this could change everything. We've actually had a few moments of that, of like architectures that seem really cool, we try them out for a bunch, you know, we spend a lot of work on them, and we realize that the keyword there is that they could change everything, but they just won't, or not yet at least. Um, and a key here is that you really need to understand the limitations of the methods, because a lot of what people do is like really, really preliminary. Um, they have a lot of flaws. They often aren't what we would call intelligent, and I think that there's like this belief that sometimes we consider what we're, like the models to be a bit more intelligent than they are, and there's no really way to get around that other than um, you know building that intuition of what would and wouldn't work by training our like biological neural networks, right? Um, there's a lot of examples of models being really dumb. I'm gonna skip this one, but I think this is a great one of like visual quen question answering. It can't answer how many chairs there are in this question. Um, and if it can't answer how many chairs there are in, in like for this problem, it seems really unlikely it'll be able to tell you what's the diameter of this nodule in, the, in this part of the lung, right? And I think that some of us have expectations of our models to do that in the very near future. Um, I think there's a great quote by Andre Karpathy where he says that everything we do in deep learning is memorization instead of thinking. And there's a lot of smart people trying to get us to the thinking level, but so far um, thinking that Assuming that our models will do something that's like intrinsically smart is probably a bad idea. Um, another big one for us. Thou shalt not believe benchmarks you haven't measured. Super common thing in, deep in medicine. You find a new problem, we wonder, like, and you may maybe have a model already, and you're thinking, like, is this model good? It's easy, right? Like, we find a paper that someone's published on it, and we say, like, what results do they get? And we check the results, and it turns out that oh, they got this really high number. This seems unrealistically good, right? It's a great question to ask, 
but it's common that there's no answer because you just can't report accuracy in a task without a data set to go along with it, and how good you do is extremely dependent on the data set that's chosen. And there's a lot of papers that choose arbitrarily useless and non-reproducible cutoffs. For example, they do like some segmentation thing, and they like, it only works on the inside of the lung and not the border of the lung, so they intentionally select only the things that they know their algorithm will do well on, and they report this number. And now other people who see this paper and cite this paper, they suddenly realize that, oh, we need to do better than this number or else no one will cite us, right? Like, why would we take a step back? And you get into this loop of getting higher and higher artificial numbers without anyone knowing any whatever is going on. So if you're doing this yourself, you're going to have to start from scratch. And you, need to, you should report accuracy for yourself, but you need to do fair comparisons. And in case you're wondering, this was not a real paper. Um, and I don't think Ch Cher Epic is a real researcher, but like, the reality is not too far off this kind of thing. It's really unfortunate. But it, it just takes a lot of work because you really need to get into the details of the papers to realize, oh, wait a minute, this is something that's completely arbitrary and we're, there's no way we're going to reproduce this. Um, number eight. I need to work on my Roman numerals. Um, Thou shall not covet thy neighbor's unsupervised data. It's very common to think that, oh, we, it's medicine. We need tons and tons of data. What could be wrong, right? Medical data is valuable. Let's just get tons of it. Um, we did that for a while, and then we realized that, oh, hey, we have you know, several hundred terabytes of this stuff that we can't even use at all. Because um, existing tip tricks are incredibly bad at leveraging unsupervised data. And it's not that it's bad to have, but it's just not good either, and there's actually much more important problems to worry about. And it's, a, it's a very common thing when people ask us for advice about like, how did you get data? Like, we only have X gigabytes of data. Um, we can't solve this problem. And we tell them, actually, we've solved similar problems by going for less data with higher quality. And this is related to the thing that we talked about a while ago of quality being important. It's just that for unsupervised data, I kind of see it as having like a quality of approximately zero, which means that all of the quantity in the world is not useful for this. Um, and if you, you know, if you want to put them to a model, it's garbage in, garbage out, right? Um, number nine, thou shalt be a hero. This one is a, a probably against the common wisdom of deep learning, where a lot of research, the researchers say that when you need to find a new architecture, don't be a hero, just use what works. And this is great for some problems in natural images, not all, but these architectures are designed to fit certain tasks, and they can easily overfit. So you end up with like, these really icky architectures, which like, you know, like, look like a spider web almost, and you just wonder like, how are these people inspired to do this? And it turns out the answer is that you know, Google spent like, months and you know, 1,000 GPUs running a ton of different variations and just picked this one because it, it worked the best. And this is implicitly fitting your problem, because architectures are kind of the priors of deep learning. They're priors that we don't understand. Like we, just d we really don't understand like how what happens if you have two cons instead of three. Um, but that doesn't mean we don't treat them like priors. And in some ways, we think that, like that this is a generally good architecture, and it's not a good architecture for the problem. And we've definitely found it to be good architectures for the problem. And for medicine, you're probably going to have to design your own ones that are good for your own modality. Um, and last one, number 10, thou shalt embrace the medical domain. There's a lot of people who come to medicine from the deep learning side, and they want to ignore the domain entirely and just use the tools they're already familiar with. Like, oh, images, I know images, let's throw VGGNet at it, um, let's throw this loss, you know, like some cross entropy, let's just, you know, just do all of this vanilla stuff. This stuff is easy, people in medicine are dumb. It's a common, common thought. Um, they think it's really easy, and like you see a lot of startups that get into it and then get out of it really quickly because they, they don't make anything that's useful. Um, but like, there's a lot of specific things in a modality that, you, that exist that you can leverage. For example, x-rays often come in groups for multiple views. It might be, you m could treat them as individual images, but it actually might be impossible to solve that problem as individual images without having a way of coordinating information from both views, because that's what people do, right? And like, the modalities are designed for people to interpret. And th you're just basically cutting out information in that case. So we need to design components to do this. For CT scans, they have highly semantic units that measure density. So you could treat it like pixels and you know, like scale it to 0, 1, and throw a normal convent at it, but you're actually losing information there that could improve data efficiency. Um, MRIs, people who've done MRIs tr like to treat them as channel, the different pulse sequences as channels. And that seems reasonable to do, but they're, not, they're often not exactly aligned. So you are, you are like, putting kind of the wrong priors into your data there. And 
I, I feel like it's just an act of laziness that we don't try to design new things for that. For medical text, it's like very morphological. It's much more morph morphological in English, where prefixes and suffixes mean some stuff. Um, so perhaps we're not getting the maximal information about that. And for genomic sequences, um, there's much longer dependencies. Um, so, yeah, if you're trying to shoe our medical problems to ones you're already familiar familiar with, you're leaving performance on the table, and we, I think we're going to end up having to build lots of custom components, and that's really where the fun part is. And you also need to build custom losses, because that's actually, like all of these things are things that you can really get a lot of performance from that people often don't think of. They think like, I'm going to plug it into CAFE and do whatever is like built in. Cool. That's it. Sorry for going a little over time. Questions? Thanks for sharing that experience. It's great. Question? Diego, thank you for the presentation. You mentioned that uh, some of the papers and the models that you tried didn't work. Mm -hmm. So what was the issue? You were not getting the performance that they promised in the paper, or did it not work well with the modality that you were focusing on? Um, it really depends on what exactly is done in the paper. Like, a paper is designed to show the best of an architecture, and a lot of these tasks are designed to show off the architecture doing really well. I think a really good example of that is, um, is this showing here? Yeah. Oops. Um, okay. Uh, give me one second to do this. Uh, it's spatial transformer networks. This is something that we thought was really cool. Um, these are things that allow you to basically pick a subset of your image and focus on it, which seems really amazing, like these kinds of things that like focus on a subset of your uh, image. These, are re these seem really amazing for medicine because in the medical domain, um, a lot of the times, majority of the information is useless, right? If you're in a taking a natural, language Im uh, natural image, you're taking a picture of something, right? In a medical image, you're taking a picture of everything, and there might be something in there. So by focusing on the specific part, that could be much more uh, computationally efficient because now you don't have to process all of that garbage. So this is something we played around with a bunch, and it turns out it doesn't work so well for that kind of task um, because of the nature of like, how this thing optimizes. So there's a lot of like, nuanced details and a lot of the little architecture stuff that makes things um, not just automatically work. It, 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 in this case, it has to do with um, trying a much harder task than what they showed off. Um, but uh, th th there's many different examples of that kind of thing. OK, everyone in the back here. Dr. Summers. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, some of the medical imaging problems that you've worked on and give us a sense of what sort of performance you're getting on those problems? Uh, by performance, you mean accuracy? Sensitivity, specificity, false positive rates, anything recognizable as a performance metric? This goes into um, believing benchmarks you haven't measured. I could give you numbers, but those numbers are useless without the data that comes along with them. Because we don't, like, no data set is, uh, that I know of at least, is truly representative of the population that people care about. Um, we try to measure things relative to human performance, which we can do for medical imaging, because humans read them. It's not possible in some tasks like genomics, because human level of performance is garbage. Um, but we, for most domains, we can get superhuman performance. But, um, and this involves detection, like detecting very small things in 3D scans detecting things in 2D scans, detecting things that are actually very unclear, that are like in multiple images, as well as classifying disease. And we can get superhuman in, in these things, but take into account that we've chosen these tasks specifically <laughs> because we think that we can do a great job at it. So that doesn't mean that we could get superhuman at every task. OK, last one, quick. Hey, nice talk, man. That was, it was nice to hear someone speak you know, in a sober manner about deep learning, talking about cool. limitations and stuff and mm -hmm. you know, combating the hype. Good work. I'm wondering, just so point, your la like two of your last three points, the point about not coveting unsupervised data, mm -hmm. and then your last point about sort of um, you know, being willing to kind of do the hard work to develop or create new, mo new loss functions, new modules, mm -hmm. layers, whatever. Um, I'm wondering if you could sort of link those two. So, in some sense, you're right about like people shouldn't get overly um, uh, fanatical about trying to get all the data they can, especially when it's uh, unlabeled and unsupervised. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a lot of settings in medicine where getting labeled data simply just isn't going to happen. And that I think there may be problems where maybe we're going to need to get creative about how to use 
unsupervised data or sort of weakly labeled data or weirdly labeled data. I'm just wondering, what, that's my intuition. How do you feel about that? Um, I think unsupervised is in a different bucket than weird and weakly supervised. Sure. I think weakly supervised is an extremely valuable source of information as long as you acknowledge that and are very careful about it because it falls into the garbage in, garbage out thing. Um, I, I think that unsupervised data, using unsupervised data is an open research problem that we can't even solve for much, much, much simpler tasks than anything relevant to medicine. Um, or at least I don't know any tasks that simple in medicine. Um, so I do think that there is a lot of interesting things that could be done to take into account the weekly and weirdly supervised. And I actually think that leveraging weekly supervised data is one of the most important things to do in medicine um, because there's a lot of data that's kind of okay all around. But this, I, I think it's a, it, it, will, it will be problem dependent. And what we've observed a lot is that even orders of magnitude less data that is much higher quality sometimes can be better. And oftentimes, if you're trying to solve something with a financial use case, you can financially justify collecting really high quality data. And there are creative ways of getting that high quality data that are even like higher quality than you know getting like five experts and average their predictions together. So there, there's a lot to do there. And I actually think that data will be the most important thing in medical deep learning. Okay, thank you, Diego.